It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. In the land of Israel, rain falls during a single crucial season of the year, beginning in October or November and continuing through the spring. Early rabbinic texts show a deep concern with the seasons, lives dependent on successful harvests, which depended on healthy rainfall. So the weather proved God's blessing or cursing to the people of Israel. In this episode, we'll learn more about this delicate situation through some of the most important Jewish texts. I'm joined by Julia Watts Belser. She's an assistant professor of Jewish studies at Georgetown University. She's published articles in places like the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion, and the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics. Her new book from Cambridge University Press is called Power, Ethics, and Ecology in Jewish Late Antiquity. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. Julia Watts Belser, thanks for coming on the Maxwell Institute podcast today. Delighted to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit first about yourself, your educational background. Uh, sure. I um, did my doctoral work at UC Berkeley and the Graduate Theological Union with a focus on Jewish studies particularly Judaism in late antiquity, interested in the study of Jewish culture and particularly through the prism of the Babylonian Talmud, one of the greatest uh, books on the Jewish bookshelf. So interested in questions of gender, sexuality, disability, ecology, kind of relationship between body and land in, um, in late antique Jewish culture. Did you anticipate that sort of academic trajectory for a long time, or how did you come to that? Was it something you looked forward to as a, as, as a younger person? Or? I was actually always really interested in the relationship between uh, social issues and religion, religious texts. But I didn't anticipate uh, falling in love with the Talmud. I really, it was really in graduate school that I came to realize that I had a deep fascination with um, with Jewish texts that I really wanted to um, focus in on the on the Talmud. Was drawn in, especially. Um, I mean, so much in Jewish studies attracted me, but there was something particularly about the quality of the Talmud, the kind of stories it would tell, the nature of its narratives that I just found uh, really engaging sometimes paradoxical, difficult, challenging, and so it felt like the kind of text that I would want to spend a long time, maybe a lifetime, um, working with. And you're also ordained as a rabbi. Maybe uh, give us a little background on that. Sure. So in addition to the academic study of Talmud and my, my, my scholarly work in Jewish studies, I also engage these texts religiously. I'm interested in, um, you know, I am a rabbi. I am interested in teaching these texts in Jewish religious contexts as well. In some ways, I think of these as two different hats that I wear. I think of the, the scholarly toolbox, which offers me a different set of critical tools, um, and then the, um, the religious tool box that invites me to think about questions of questions of, of meaning and and the the sort of inner significance of the text but even as I make that uh, that neat distinction I think it's a little bit facile and as I look at my own work I see I'm interested in thinking about some of the gentle interplays between the questions of how scholarship can in fact engage live alongside with uh, religious questions, but not be subordinated to them, remain uh, critical, curious, engaged, um, and also an expression of uh, religious, in its own way, religious commitment. So in terms of how your academic work and your uh, religious faith come together, there's, there, there are a lot of scholars who kind of uh, demarcate between when they're working in the academy and when they're working in synagogue or in church or, or anything like that. And how has that played out in your uh, experience and in, in the work that you produce? Right. It's a great question. So I think it's, for me, very important to think carefully about the relationship between those two different spheres. And also in a lot of my academic, historically focused scholarship to keep a kind of clear distance between the personal religious dimension and the scholarly work. Um, my current book, Power, Ethics, and Ecology in Jewish Late Antiquity is a work of historical scholarship. I'm interested in unpacking how the uh, rabbis in late antiquity write about and think about their own texts. And so I'm 
it's not a place where I find my own voice coming out on the page in terms of my own uh, beliefs, my own principles. In fact, there are a number of times where I find my own inner life somewhat at odds with the texts I'm writing about. And so it feels particularly important to pursue not just what feels attractive or interesting or compelling to me in these texts, but also to delve deeper into the places where I feel some dissonance with my own sense of, of, uh, of religious sensibility. Have people come to you and sort of suggested like, oh, you, you just need to like not make that kind of a distinction. I know some people uh, don't like that kind of a distinction, but other scholars have found it a really fruitful way to engage with their work. So how do you you talk to people that say, you know, that they don't like that division or that they don't think that's a legit way to do it? To me, it's just been an important division uh, to be able to keep, uh, to think about my, my historical work and my more, because I also engage in um, I work in Jewish ethics, I think constructively around about theological and ethical questions. So I have another a sort of alternate space in which I feel free to engage those questions. And so some of the narratives that emerge in treated in one way in my book, right, will come up in a different context, discussed in a very different way. And you know, that's just, that's the strategy that I found most straightforward, most transparent. Of course, it's all happening in one life. So yeah. there's, uh, there's a lovely interplay in my own head between these, but I'm, I'm also fairly tolerant of cognitive dissonance and, and open to holding that kind of dissonance within uh, these texts. So I think of myself as someone who uh, both, both deeply loves the Talmud right? and is quite, uh, also quite, quite uh, critical at times at odds with the religiosity, the values that it presents. Yeah, it's almost, I like you brought up context is a really important word that I, that I think a lot of people answer this question this way is to think of, you wouldn't show up to a friend's birthday party ready with a paper that you've typed up ready to read to them like you would at a conference or something like these are different venues where you're doing different things it doesn't necessarily devalue one particular task over another It just is in these particular contexts this is an appropriate way you're following historical methodology and assessing data that's different than making a judgment based on values and stuff like that. Exactly, exactly. For me, it's particularly important to allow the text to say things I don't like. Yeah. Right? Of course, I'm also interested in bringing, I mean, I think the kind of readings that I do become possible in part because I'm interested in certain things in the text. So I see things, I am looking for things that another reader not, uh, not reading with the same eyes might gloss over, might not find interesting but as a as an act of fidelity to the text to be true to the text I think it's also very important to give voice to those places where uh, I I am not um, I'm not in love it's a really fascinating conversation that the intersection of in one person of their sort of religious sensibilities and their academic sensibilities and how those relate to each other is fascinating. And, and I think, like you said, in this particular book that we're talking about in, in this interview, uh, Power, Ethics, and Ecology in Jewish Late Antiquity, uh, it is a, a work of, of historical analysis. So uh, I, I wanted to start uh, the main part of the interview here. I wanted to begin by asking you to read a passage from Deuteronomy that you placed at the beginning of this book. I think this passage does a nice job of setting the stage for it. It kind of combines power ethics and ecology and Jewish late antiquity right here in this passage from the Hebrew Scriptures. This is from Deuteronomy uh, 11, if you'll read from that. Wonderful. Thanks. This is uh, a translation that follows the beautiful work of Robert Alter in his five books of Moses. So here's Deuteronomy 11, 11 through 15. From the rain of the heavens, you will drink water, a land that the Lord your God seeks out perpetually. The eyes of the Lord your God are upon it from the year's beginning to the year's end. If you heed my commands with which I charge you today to love the Lord your God and to worship him with all your heart and with all your being, I will give the rain of your land in its season, early rains and late, and you shall gather in your grain and your wine and your oil, and I will give grass in the field to your herds, and you shall eat and be satisfied. So this scripture you cite in order to kind of talk about Deuteronomy laying out a vision of rain as relationship, and I wanted you to to expand on that. 
Sure. So I should say first, in terms of context, that these biblical verses that I just read have a very important place, both in rabbinic Jewish religiosity and in contemporary Jewish practice. They're part of the Shema, which is um, probably the most important, the most central Jewish prayer. It is an affirmation of divine unity, and it is also an expression of the kind of deep covenantal commitment within Jewish life. So I'm calling that the Shema. Oh, the Shema, the Shema. Shema, okay. Shema. It's uh, one of those words I only read, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. Well, now you've, now you've heard it said. Um, <laughs> the, the Shema is repeated twice, twice a day. So you hear the centrality of these, uh, of these words, of this text, and I think that they also clue us into um, an ecological dimension that's present at the heart of Jewish religiosity. When we come to that passage in the Shema, we're not just talking about a sort of disembodied love between God and humanity. We are talking about a love that's expressed in part through rain, that's manifest in the flowering and the flourishing of the earth. But so in Deuteronomy, rain is an expression of God's great generosity. For the rabbis of the Talmud, rain is imagined as the, one of the greatest gifts that God gives. It's God's gift to the land. It's God's gift to the people. It is a sign of God's love and loyalty both to, the, um, to humanity and to the earth. But the passage in Deuteronomy emphasizes that that gift unfolds in expressly covenantal terms. It begins with what I call one of the Hebrew Bible's biggest ifs. That is, if you heed my commands with which I charge you today, then I will give you rain. So if the Israelites heed God's command, then the earth will flower with grapes, with grain, the grasses of the field will be lush, humans and animals alike will eat and they will be satisfied. But, and here's the flip side, if the Israelites turn away from God, if they don't live by God's law, then God will withhold rain and drought will cause the earth to wither, which will, of course, also cause the animals and the humans to wither and there will be starvation and grief um, in the land. So my, my book is subtitled Rabbinic Responses to Drought and Disaster. And as much as I spend time talking about the wondrous texture that um, these Talmudic narratives give to that idea of God's gift of rain. I'm particularly interested here in parsing out what happens when that gift is withheld, right? when rain is not present. Um, because when we hear this passage today, we have to remember that the Hebrew Bible emerges out of an intense moment of e ecological vulnerability. This is an ecologically vulnerable land. Yeah, this is something that's like very present to them, right? I think sometimes today when we think about rain, it's almost more in a romantic sense. I, unless you're in an area that's encountered si significant drought or, or water issues, um, it's just water's just there. We turn it on at the tap. Uh, so it's a different kind of geography. It's a different landscape. Exactly. It's a different geography, a different landscape. I actually wrote this. I started writing this book. Um, this book had its very early life as a dissertation. So I wrote that in, in, um, in Northern California, where drought is, of course, often on, on people's minds. Um, the landscape of, I'm sorry, the, the, the ecology of California is actually very similar to the ecology of Israel-Palestine. Then I moved to Missouri. Missouri and Missouri, when I was there and the couple of years I was there, had a very intense drought as well. So it's actually the writing of the book has actually really sensitized me to the, the significant vulnerability of many lands in which I have lived. But particularly when we think about Israel, the land we now call Israel, Palestine in late antiquity, um, this is a, a moment where the people, the writers of these passages, are very aware of living on the edge. Okay? Um, it's a semi-arid ecology. It's a region that receives abundant rain in just one single season of the year. So in, the few, in a few winter months, the land has to soak up enough rain to sustain itself for the entire year to come. Um, that means that drought is a very present threat 
Um, and when it comes, drought is devastating to humans, animals, and earth alike. So what you do in the book then is you take this overarching idea of the covenant God made here, and that's emphasized twice daily in, in a fundamental prayer of, of Judaism here, and you talk about how it plays out in later Jewish texts. So yeah. uh, these, particularly one called the Bavli Ta'anit, um, right. and this is a portion of the Babylonian Talmud. So let's give people a better sense of the sources themselves before we move on, because most sure. people are familiar with the Bible, uh, but these extra texts, especially, uh, I have a lot of Christian listeners, so they're less familiar with these uh, texts. Absolutely. The Babylonian Talmud is probably one of the most important books on the Jewish bookshelf that you've never heard of. It is probably the most important Jewish book after the Hebrew Bible. It, the Babylonian Talmud is a vast, complex compendium of Jewish law and lore. It's a post-biblical text, so significantly later than the Hebrew Bible. It's usually dated, it's usually, its completion is usually dated to somewhere in the 6th or the 7th century, hotly contested by scholars, and I'm not interested in taking a stand here. <laughs> um, that's 6th or 7th century of the Common Era. So just before the advent of Islam, it represents several centuries worth of oral tradition, debate, and discussion by the rabbis of Jewish Babylonia. And that's a, Babylonia is a region that's roughly equivalent to modern-day Iraq and Iran. So the Babylonian Talmud, called the Bavli for short, right, contains all kinds of texts and traditions, debates, arguments about Jewish law and Jewish practice, stories and legends, biblical commentary. Each volume of the Babylonian Talmud centers on a particular aspect of Jewish practice. So my book is uh, an analysis of one particular volume, that's Bavli Ta'anit. Okay? And Bavli Ta'anit addresses the practice of fasting in response to drought. So in, in some respects, we could say this is a text that is about religious response to environmental crisis. Right? It's full of rabbinic teachings about rain, right? but it's also uh, full of stories and texts and traditions and rituals and laws whereby the rabbis are attempting to make s grapple with how they can respond to rain's absence. Drought, I think, is like the climate change of the ancient world. Right? If there's some equivalent to con current contemporary environmental threat, right? and I don't actually think there is, Right? But the closest I could come would be drought in terms of the kind of existential dread, the great fear that it provoked, and also the sense that it was a, um, a, a phenomenon that just is, um, is huge, can hugely affect people's daily lives and their ordinary um, ordinary rhythms of life. Yeah, it's like the biggest difference between that, your comparison with climate change would be uh, people back then didn't have the luxury uh, of denying that it was going on. I mean, this was, you know, especially <laughs> like right in their face. It's a really great point. And that, that point about the inability to deny it is actually especially apropos in a place like Israel, Palestine, because you know when the rain is supposed to come. Yeah. You have a point where you know that the rain is going to, should fall. So if the rain is late, if the rains are delayed, if the rainy season, right, is happening on the calendar, but it's not happening in real life, then the community is aware of crisis. And that rain calendar is tied deeply into the Jewish year. Right? So it's tied into the liturgical year. It's connected to Jewish holidays. So, um, to get inside that idea of the rain calendar, I think we can imagine this as something that um, it's likely that that people would have felt these seasons, right, these seasons of rain, as part of their understanding of the kind of sacred cycle of Jewish time. Yeah, so it was connected directly to kind of like like we said at the outset, their relationship to God was directly tied to how yeah. how well the yeah. <laughs> the rains were falling or not. Yes, yes. So you tie it into the idea of fasting here. Um, oh, one, one more question on that. Ta'anit, uh, what, what does that word mean? Uh, it is the way that the rabbis talk about a fast. Okay, okay, good. So, well, that's a perfect transition. This is a then, fast on fasts. <laughs> okay, uh, good. And, and fasting is the ritual technology that the rabbis use to respond to rain crisis. They use it for a variety of things. It's their go-to um, method 
of dealing with major communal crisis. Right? There's actually a lot of things that you can use fasting to do in, in late antique Judaism, but I want to focus in on this idea of fasting as a response to communal crisis, because that's where it's important here. And I actually, I think fast, I find fasting a really fascinating response to rain crisis. Uh, if you think about what fasting does, it brings the body center stage. Right? When you are intentionally withholding food and water, you become hyper aware of the body and its needs. So fasting as a practice emphasizes both the spiritual and the, and the visceral corporeal dimensions of drought. In a way, fasting is actually about anticipating crisis. It's about mapping a crisis that is eventually going to come if the drought continues onto the body and feeling it first on a kind of voluntary basis right, before it becomes an involuntary affliction. So when the community begins to fast, there's not actually a food crisis yet. Right? They're fasting while their larders are still full. They could eat, right? but they're intentionally withholding food in order to kind of transform their circumstance. They know that if rain doesn't come soon, they'll face hunger and famine in the year to come. So fasting, I think, is a way to realize physically and somatically the seriousness of the crisis that they're facing. It's also a way that they hope to transform hearts and minds, right? to, to bring the community together and also to be able to engage in contrition, uh, regret, repair, to cry out to God and thereby hopefully transform the relationship that is out of whack, that's manifest here in the draft. Do the records suggest that they emphasize one, one over the other? It seems like the first description is very technical and sort of um, really gets into sort of the symbolic meaning of, of how fasting is related to drought. The other seems more in terms of just uh, God's upset, we do this, God gets happy, we get rain. Like Yeah, yeah. So the, an earlier rabbinic text, the Mishnah, uh, focuses, uh, lays out the kind of uh, procedure for ritual fasting. And then the Babylonian Talmud, Bavli Tani, expands and discusses it at great length. Um, so I think we see both of these paradigms present in the in the text. I will add that I'm I'm this this analysis that I just offered of the kind of symbolic significance of fasting. They never come out and say that. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is really where you see me as a scholar trying to under, trying to get inside the religious practice to better understand what its significance is, how it is relating, you know, why it matters that they're yeah. fasting rather than doing some other kind yeah, of... Yeah, like offering some sort of sacrifice or... Exactly, guilt, yeah. exactly. Well, sa sacrifice is foreclosed to them, but, you know, presumably they could have developed any other, you know... Right, because the temple's gone now, right? Technologies. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So then, you, uh, so you talk about how the rabbis sort of lay out an incremental approach. It's not just like full, uh, full fasting enforcement here right from the beginning. There's sort of a way they roll it out. That's right. So you actually start with, um, in, this, in this rabbinic system of responding to rain crisis with, with fasts, you start with private fasts that are undertaken by elite individuals. You got to be someone to, um, to start the fast. Okay? Uh, so people are, uh, are, are fasting privately, right? hoping to break the drought, hoping to bring rain. If the drought extends, if the rain crisis becomes more intense, then the entire community gets involved. First for what we might think of as partial fasts or half fasts, and then for a more elaborate fast that really deeply changes the very character of people's daily lives. Um, at the height of the process, the rabbis describe how the whole community goes out into the public square. They pray together, they've got their Torah scrolls there, they are aware of their misdeeds and shortcomings, they're reciting an extended liturgy, calling out to God, trusting in God's compassion. They anoint themselves with ashes, and then, this is a, to me a really amazing gesture, then they put ashes on the Torah scroll itself. I find that a very powerful moment, and it seems the rabbis did too, because they comment on it. One of the Talmudic rabbis, Rabbi Zera, says, when I saw that they were putting ashes on the Torah scroll, my whole body trembled. Mm 
I love that image of Rabbi Zera's body trembling right, as he sees the Torah anointed with ash. Symbolically here, I want to kind of riff poetic, poetically and suggest that actually there's a way in which the Torah scroll is almost imagined as a kind of body. Yeah. Right? Of course, God doesn't have a body in rabbinic Judaism per se, at least not a human fleshy body. Right? But here the Torah scroll becomes a kind of tangible, concrete presence of the holy right? in the midst of the community. So the Torah scroll becomes this symbolic representation of God's presence. And the rabbis actually read it quite explicitly as an affirmation that God is here in the midst of the community, in the midst of their crisis. So the rabbis use a couple of uh, biblical verses to understand this, this, this gesture. Isaiah 63, 9, in all their troubles, God was troubled. They quote Psalm 9, 15, it is as if to say, I will be with him, that is, I, God, will be with the community in trouble. So the rabbis are reading these verses to affirm that God is not distant. God is not somehow set apart from the community, but actually present when the community is in trouble, when the people are in danger. I see them saying here, somewhat obliquely, but nonetheless quite, quite strongly, that God is moved by human suffering, that God is in fact troubled by, affected by human pain. That's Julia Watts Belser. She's an assistant professor of Jewish studies in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University. And she's published articles in places like the Journal of American Academy of Religion, Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion, and her new book that we're talking about today is from Cambridge University Press. It's called Power, Ethics, and Ecology in Jewish Late Antiquity. Okay, so overall, um, that kind of lays out the basic gist of the book where you're talking about um, the problem that was faced and the way that the uh, that the uh, that the text sort of uh, invites the community to respond to this crisis, uh, and it's all contingent on their relationship with God and how they respond to God. Uh, but like we were mentioning at the outset, uh, it's really ecologically focused, uh, and, and this is kind of part of a wider academic focus on ecology that we're seeing more recently in the academy, so maybe you can give us some background on that sort of ecological turn in scholarship. Sure. There's been a lot of attention to ecology in the humanities in the last decade or so. Right? Scholars of history, literature, religion are coming to realize that ecology is profoundly important for all aspects of human culture. So we see ecology, I think, moving out from, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's certainly of importance in the sciences, but we see now the humanities kind of getting a piece of ecology, thinking about the way in which um, the relationship between the kind of web of relations between people, land, place, uh, how deeply that affects the stories we tell, the way we imagine ourselves, the literatures we produce, the rituals, the practices. In biblical studies, we see this most clearly, I think, in the recognition that you can't fully understand the religious thought of the Bible without understanding the people's relationship with the land. My book is aiming to bring that attention, that type of attention, to rabbinic texts as well, to understand how the Babylonian Talmud, the Bavli, conceptualizes and relates to the created world. It asks questions like, how, how are the rabbis relating to or thinking about their connection with land and place? How does that shape their ethics, their theology, their ritual, their practice, and their readings of the biblical text? So how do you prevent yourself from sort of injecting current contemporary concerns back onto the past? Um, we talked about climate change, for example. So pe there's people who are very aware of ecological issues right now, and it can be tempting to just take our own concerns and sort of put them back on the past text. So absolutely, how do you negotiate that? Absolutely. This is really, this is really important. And I think that um, here again, I'm going to go back to that distinction we made at the very start of our conversation between a kind of historically, academically framed uh, approach that's interested in understanding the, the rabbi's own world. That's what I'm doing in this book. And a more um, and a more uh, kind of scholarship that's interested in in the practical implications, the kind of contemporary religious engagement with classical texts uh, for the purposes of articulating a contemporary religious environmentalism. 
I'm actually quite interested in both questions, but it's uh, but I want to be clear what I'm doing in this book. Yeah. Okay? In this book, I'm interested in getting inside the head of the ancient rabbis. I want to know how they related to the land. Right? How do they understand the drought? Right? Um, I'm not so interested in this book. Right? In fact, I eschew entirely right? uh, thinking about the what, so what question in terms of contemporary Jewish communities. Right. How are you going to use this to transform your own synagogue, your own community's relationship to the earth today? Right? Um, so. I'm a great proponent of religious environmental engagement. Some of my other work has looked at how rabbinic texts can be creatively reread to articulate a contemporary Jewish response to climate change, for example, or to recognize and resist environmental racism or violence or other forms of in disproportionate environmental harms. So I'm very comfortable with that kind of uh, activist work. Right, with that kind of uh, explicit engagement with constructive ethics. But this book is interested in um, understanding the ancient rabbis' own self-understandings right, of their relationship, uh, the way they see the relationship between humans, rain, God, and the earth. I wanted so, to ask on that but yeah, sure. before you continue. Is Are there people within the tradition that, that, that would privilege that historical interpretation. They would say, look, okay, so we figured out how they saw it at that time. We need to lock into that and think that way. And these newer ways of thinking in terms of social justice are somehow modern impositions on what we should really be focusing on. Do you, do you see any of that within the Jewish community where they resist this type of reading on those grounds? Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I, I, um, I hesitate to say no, because I think, of course, you can always find people who will resist a reading on virtually any grounds. <laughs> yeah. but, in, um, but the way Jewish texts and tradition work, I mean, there's often a kind of, the, the rabbis themselves right, are grappling with and interpreting biblical texts, that is, from texts from an earlier era, an earlier moment, in light of their own concerns. I mean, they, so this work of the, the process of doing the work of textual interpretation is deeply embedded in the nature of how Jewish communities have tended to approach text and tradition. Now, that's not to say that, I mean, of course, some people will find certain readings, some Jews will find certain readings of text objectionable on all sorts of grounds, right? But the idea that you would interpret texts it seems to me very deeply embedded in the fabric of the of the tradition. Okay. So okay. Good. So I interrupted you. You were you were talking about avoiding anachronism. Yeah. So um, I I think that um, the on the scholarly side, of course, um, there's sometimes uh, academics can get very concerned about the imposition of modern categories into ancient into and onto ancient texts. And in this in this book too, I work very hard to try and avoid that to stay away from modern categories. It's harder than you would think, especially when you're writing about things like ecology. Um, yeah. The commonplace idea of nature, for example, right, is something that I see as a, an imposition on this text. Um, I don't think Bavli Tani really has a category of nature in the way we moderns tend to conceptualize it. When we think about nature, we usually imagine um, a kind of landscape, a backdrop, right? um, a sort of set piece that's out there. Yep, okay. it's a setting. It's apart from us. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Bavli Tani doesn't talk about nature. Right? It sees the whole world, humans and cows and acacia trees. Um, actually, uh, scrap the part about cows, but humans <laughs> and acacia trees and goats. Let's stick with goats, right? Alike as um, as as creation, as an expression of God's creation, creative power. So this category of creation. Even though I'm actually a little bit allergic to using creation in contemporary in contemporary discourse because of the way sometimes creation codes as a like anti-science, yeah. oh, uh, you know, um, yep. but creation is re that's their category. Right? That's the category that's meaningful for them. So I'm interested in thinking about how again how does it work? Right. So um, as a cultural historian of ancient Jewish texts, I think we have to approach the past, or at least in this kind of work. I believe in approaching the past with an interest in its differences from our modern moment. 
I want to see its strangeness. I think that's part of the magic of these texts, these ancient sources. They have the ability to transport us to a different way of knowing, a different kind of world. Um, so one of the ways this is expressed in Bavli Tanit, we see Bavli Tanit unfold a really, what I find a really fascinating portrait of God's presence manifest and expressed in the world, in the created world. In Bavli Tani, the rabbis inhabit a world that is full of divine signs. Everything is charged with meaning. It's like hypercharged with divine presence. So everything, anything, every cloud, every dirt track, every happening, all of it can be an expression of divine revelation. So you mentioned creation is a word that's sort of been used by more uh, by people to sort of resist scientific thinking. But then you also talk about getting into ways of knowing that are more into uh, what might seem foreign to modern thinkers today, that, that you can find God everywhere. So on the one hand, you would sort of resist those fundamentalist leaning interpretations of creation. But on the other hand, you're talking about texts that, that seem to have uh, at least something in common with that, where, where God is just like everywhere, every moment. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, this is one. So on the one hand, I guess there's two ways I will answer this. On the one hand, I'd say, I don't have to like the text. I have to explain it. To you, okay? But I do like this text. Yeah. And the reason that I like this text is that I think it gives us a vision of um, a very kind of imminent Jewish notion of God. Right? A sense that the divine is not utterly separate from the, the created world. Again, here, I'll use their, I'll use their category. Right? So this, um, in, in some ways, I find that an incredibly beautiful um, notion, right? a sense that you could in some way, I mean, here I'm, I'm being more romantic than, um, than, than the rabbis are, but just to kind of flesh it out, I mean, this is, a, this is a kind of worldview through which you can imagine coming to know or, or sense something of God's presence, God's revelation. Right? In, um, in, the, in the nature of the clouds, right? um, in, the, in the fact of the rain. So um, I think that there's a lot you can do with creation and creation um, and, and ideas of creation that are very pro-environmental. We see this actually in many Christian communities with the creation care movement, right? which is an attempt to use uh, creation and the idea of God's creation is a very strong state, a strong foundation for a uh, for Christian environmental uh, responsibility and Christian environmental action. We've been talking a lot about the rabbis, and we we gave a little bit of background on the texts themselves, but we haven't talked much about the place of the rabbis in the religious community of of the first centuries of the Common Era. So let's uh, let's talk about that for for a minute. Sure, sure. So the first few centuries of the Common Era were a formative time for the rabbis. Uh, we usually, scholars usually date the beginning of the rabbinic period to the Roman destruction of the Jerusalem Temple, that's the second Jerusalem Temple, in 70 CE. Um, we used to, sort of old scholarly paradigm used to be that the rabbis sprung fully formed and victorious from the ashes of that great uh, defeat. But now scholars recognize that the rabbis began really like any new religious movement as a marginal group. Right? That they too had to construct and develop their own authority, that they didn't arrive immediately as, as confident and well-respected uh, authoritative uh, religious voices. So for the first three or four centuries of the Common Era, the rabbis don't have the ability to command anyone's allegiance. Right? Over time, gradually, we see their influence growing, their circles are widening, they begin to become more, uh, more widely influential. Right? And eventually, by the early medieval era, their texts have become a powerful and authoritative force for expressing normative Jewish culture and, and, and Jewish practice. At this point, virtually every form of modern Jewish practice traces itself back in some way to these foundational rabbinic texts. 
So how would one become a rabbi at that point? And were they creating like schools or did they oversee synagogues or how did it work structurally? Uh, the rabbis are at this point not, not necessarily so closely associated with synagogues, but you're right, your idea of the schools is, is, is right, right? But first, before we get to rabbis in school, in the in schools, right, or academies is what they um, would, would, would um, we often use the term, um, the rabbis really, the earlier model of rabbinic, uh, of, 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 of rabbinic learning is more on the order of disciple circles. Okay? So a couple, a couple followers, a couple students right, who learn from a respected rabbi. Right? Who these are all or at this point all oral traditions that are being passed down. So they are lo- learning the oral Torah of their teachers. Right? They are commenting on it, passing it down in their teachers' names, but also adding their own insights. Eventually, that grows and develops. We see the disciple the disciple circles begin to give way to more formal structures of of uh, of, of 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 schools or academies. Um, uh, and then by and so by the end of our period, the point where the uh, Babylonian Talmud is is canonized, we can we can talk about two great academies in Babylonia, two sort of recognized and known schools. But that's a very long process. Um, and I think it's important to underscore the fragility of it, especially at the outset. It's not something we get an, uh, a sense of from just reading rabbinic texts. The rabbinic texts, in the in rabbinic texts, the rabbis present themselves yeah. as confident jurists. That's the so point. You get the yeah. Impression that they're in control of the whole right. affair, but uh, history suggests otherwise, and in fact suggests that they are engaging in part in a kind of confidence game. Right? that will eventually uh, turn out to be masterfully successful. So your book introduces a really interesting idea into the conversation here that resists some of the some of the bigger assumptions people make about rabbis. So there's this idea that um, the Bavli Ta'anit, for example, uh, was a text that would then be used to bolster rabbinic authority, that these teachings and, and decisions and things, they were using texts in order to justify their authority in the communities and and they're they're probably even their relationship with God as as sort of almost representative of, of, of God as interpreters of what God's will is for the community and so forth. You say the the texts though, they don't just they're not just these superhero stories about rabbis or anything, but they but they're also uh, recognize and critique rabbinic ethical failings. So they're not papering over they're not presenting themselves as whitewashed heroes or anything they're also that's critiquing right. themselves and critiquing past figures that's right that's right and this is in my view one of the most distinctive and interesting dimensions of the babylonian talmud and i see it very uh very clearly in bavli tanit so this is a kind of both and scenario we want to hold both pieces of this together on the one hand it's absolutely important to see the way in which this text the Babylonian Talmud is in, in, in particularly Babli Tani, is engaged in the project of constructing and reinforcing rabbinic authority. Right? They're involved in the practice of fashioning rabbinic power. But it's also, at the same time, it's open, surprisingly open, I think, to critiquing rabbinic authority. It tells stories that portrays rabbis in a negative light. It shows their ethical failures. It reveals the frailties of rabbinic culture. So it's an interesting question. How does the text manage to do this? What is it that makes it possible for the text to tell these um, not so flattering stories about some of its cherished culture heroes? First of all, um, it's important to know that the Bavli tends to tell its least flattering stories about the most respected rabbis. So somewhat paradoxically, it's much more likely to tell a sort of... um, tell a a story that emphasizes the shortcomings of someone we all know is one of the greats. Part of the reason that the Bavli can do this, that it can do this kind of self-critical work is I think because it's, it's completed, it's completed, its, its sort of final form is redacted and composed at a point where the rabbis are sufficiently well established that they can afford to be self-critical. They can afford to turn their gaze inward. They can do the difficult work of ethical reflection. They can hold up a mirror to some of their flaws. 
Uh, it's important here to note that the Babylonian Talmud is an insider text. It's meant to be read and studied and learned primarily by other rabbis or wannabe rabbis. Right? So they're not necessarily proclaiming all of these stories uh, at large to their actual uh, competitors or people who are critiquing them on the streets. Right? They're using these stories inside the study house mm. right? as a kind of reflection. Right? Uh, a source of ethical reflection for thinking about how to do better. I think we should read this as the Bavli's means of striving to make better rabbis, to help its own rabbis grapple with the dangers of power and authority. It's in effect asking them to check themselves, to work against the tendency towards self-aggrandizement or the potential to become haughty or overly self-assured. It's fascinating because on the one hand, as you said, they, they had to have enough power established to where they wouldn't feel anxious about uh, critique, right? So it's almost like people who resist critique the most might feel threatened the most. They might mm -hmm. feel most mm -hmm. most vulnerable, whereas these figures felt comfortable enough in their skin to go ahead and, and, and engage with, with self-critique. On the other hand, then so there's still anxiety there, but the anxiety there is that uh, they would use their position to... Uh, become overly haughty or self-assured, as you said. So the anxiety sort of transfers from being like, do we have enough power to are we abusing our power? Yeah, I think this is, in some ways, I read many of these texts, many of these stories as kind of meditations on the possibilities and perils of power. I mean, I'm fascinated by power, so I'm always interested in looking at the ramifications of power. It's the first one word the, in your book title, so you got Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so one of the things that attracted me about these texts was the fact that the rabbis don't always come off looking so good. There's yeah. something there about power, about the capacity of a, of a community, of, a, of an elite group within a community to be self-reflexive that I find very interesting. Um, and and actually quite worth thinking about, right? Not that we should adopt their same model per se today, but this seems to me a really important question for contemporary religious practitioners, contemporary, uh, you know, all of us who hold power in whatever way within our within our lives, within our communities, how to think about the the um, its dangers. Yeah, I see you setting the stage for that, especially in the last chapter. And it, as we've talked about all along, you, you don't take that extra step in this book because that's not what this book is. But you do set the stage for that kind of thinking when yes. you're talking, uh, when you're relating stories about women and, and men with low status who had the ability to do things that the rabbis were expected to do. So talk more about how gender and class are represented in the texts. Sure. So the final chapter of my book examines a series of stories that praise the simple piety of the anonymous, humble, holy man and holy woman. The presence of a couple of women here is actually quite significant in rabbinic Judaism, yeah. because we don't necessarily always see women emerging in quite this, this light. But these figures often are revealed to be more virtuous and more pious than some of the greatest of the rabbis. So in one instance, an unknown man averts a plague and spares his neighborhood, not because he's a great scholar of Torah, not because he's a master of the law in according to the, the value system of rabbinic Judaism, but because he lends out his hoe and his shovel to the local cemetery. A woman protects her neighbors from a blaze of fire because she shares her oven with her neighbors. It's a concrete act of communal protection that trumps the efforts of the great sage Rav Huna. So in another story, Rava, one of the greatest rabbis of the late Babylonian academy, is utterly crestfallen when he learns that God sends a daily personal missive to an otherwise unknown guy, Abba the Bloodletter. Right? The, the, the blood letter, letter yeah. A blood letter is a is a is a healer. He's yes. a medical practitioner, but let's be clear: he is not at the top of the rabbinic social hierarchy. Okay? And not so, a prestigious bloodletting. What? Not a prestigious. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, he has some prestige, but certainly, if the rabbis were doing a sort of ordinary ranking of merits, they would place themselves yeah. far higher uh, in terms of ideally, who's got favor with God? Oh, clearly, it's the rabbis. Yes. But. Rava, it turns out, so Abba the Bloodletter gets his correspondence from God on a daily basis. And Rava, it turns out, only gets personal connection with God 
once a year. So Rava is quite distraught about this, and he sends out his um, he sends out his rabbi minions to discover what Abba's secret is, and also probably to try and reveal that he's not actually worthy of divine favor after all. But it, but Rava's ruse backfires. Um, despite the rabbi's terrible behavior, Abba the blood letter reveals himself to be a humble virtuous, pious man, hospitable, careful, generous. And the reader is left to conclude that he is, in fact, actually far more worthy than the two hapless rabbis in the tale who steal his own rugs and try and sell them in the market, or the illustrious reader, leader of the Babylonian Rabbinic Academy who sent those other rabbis in the first place. So. In thinking about these type of stories, I, um, I appeal to the work of the, the great historian of late antiquity, Peter Brown. He's talked about this type of tale as a story that dramatizes what he calls paradoxes of sanctity. And he's, he's particularly focused on uh, late antique Christian texts, so he emphasizes that this kind of storytelling appears quite often in Syriac, that is Eastern Christian uh, sources from around the same time and, and actually relatively a similar geographical area. These tales, I think, underscore the idea that holiness and divine favor don't correlate neatly with social status right? or with any other external signs or marks of a person's virtue. Right? So in the rabbinic texts, they serve as a powerful somewhat unsettling reminder that the usual markings of high class, good status, right? masculinity, learning, elite family background, don't actually testify to a person's piety or their character. So these teachings are part and parcel of what I see as one of Bafli Tanit's central theological and ethical claims. You can't actually judge by looking. You can't make a clear and convincing link between social status and divine favor. Those external signs of success, prosperity, and acclaim, right, they don't actually reveal the inner dimensions of the heart. They don't tell us much, maybe anything, about the nature of a person's piety or the truth of their connection with God. So that raises the question, if that's the case on an individual level, where you can't tell based on how prosperous a person is, how righteous they are, how that then reads onto that wider covenant narrative that we talked about in Deuteronomy, where God promises uh, rain and abundance when the community is righteous. And so... This is, I think you've just named the crux of one of the most important and potentially subversive right, dimensions of what's going on in Bavli Tanit. Right? So... In the biblical book of Deuteronomy, we see this very clear notion of covenantal ecology. It's a claim that God's favor and God's reign come in response to good behavior. But Bavli Tani complicates this idea. It doesn't entirely disown it, but it certainly messes up the neat and tidy um, assessment that we saw in Deuteronomy, where Deuteronomy has a strict notion that obedience to God will get you a favorable weather forecast Bavli Tanit is just not so sure. So in Bavli Tanit, we see the idea that virtue and piety might be rewarded. But that might is a critical difference than the confidence we saw in Deuteronomy. Okay? It might be rewarded. Okay? But Bavli Tanit also knows that sometimes there's a real disconnect between right action and reward. So I see this as a very theologically significant idea. It's the recognition that signs of divine favor are not so easy to read after all. The health, healthy, wealthy, meteorologically well off, these aren't necessarily the ones who have God's blessing. And on the communal level as well, we see this too. You can, you can, if you think about the context of Jewish communities in, in, in late antiquity, Right? where uh, a lot of Jewish history can be told as a series of one disaster after the next. Right? You, you can see how this might be an 
interesting, important, meaningful, resonant theology. Right? That the external circumstances of a community don't actually testify in a conclusive way to its connection to God. It seems like that would become even even way more important uh, post Shoah, post Holocaust, where uh, something terrible, uh, something unimaginable occurred, and the question of where was God, uh, or you know, the question of was there something done that that merited that, and so it seems like the whole conversation has even shifted even further since that time. Is that your sense too? That yes. Yes, I think in the wake of in the wake of the Shoah after the Holocaust, we see. Uh, particularly in the couple, um, in, the, in the decades after, we see an, um, many modern Jewish theologians expressly reject the idea that there's a connection between sin and punishment, that you could understand an event like the Holocaust in terms of this sort of if-then, right? Mm -hmm. If you're good, I will reward you. If you are bad, I will punish you. The rabbis aren't there. Right? They still keep the basic premise of Deuteronomy's covenantal ecology intact. But they're working from within right, to, to challenge its certainties, right? to suggest, in fact, that what, Deuteronom what the Deuteronomist seems to see as so clear-cut has become a lot more complicated. So they still seem to believe that divine signs are everywhere. Right? The problem is they're hard to read. Mm -hmm. right? We're not very good at deducing right, the kind of message that appears right, in the weather, right, in the political fortunes of the community. And there's a whole passage in the in the, in the book where I talk about how the the rabbis examine um, the the kind of confusions that exist. People read or look at a body, right, a very ugly man, right, and assume that he's scorned by God. And they are critiqued for making that assumption, right? for assuming that the container, the external, um, ex the, ex the exterior, right, reveals in some way the interior. Right? So it's in some ways a very interesting, I mean, I, I hesitate, I don't want to think of it in, in terms of, um, you know, that this is somehow modern, because it's not. This is this is a late, an late antique idea that's yeah. being emerged here by the rabbis. But I do think in some ways that they are at least... Um, playing with, exploring some notions and ideas that will prove to be very important uh, in later Jewish thought as well. It's, it's a place where a revered, where a fundamental religious text has to be reckoned with in real time, in, in confrontation with active, actual experience, uh, actual embodied experience. And that is a negotiation that just goes on and on. Yes, yes. That's Julia Watts Belser. She's assistant professor of Jewish studies at Georgetown University, and we're speaking about her book, Power Ethics and Ecology in Jewish Late Antiquity. We'll take a break and be right back. Believers and scientists have wrestled for centuries over the relationship between reason and faith, science and religion. Award-winning Latter-day Saint author and biologist Stephen Peck believes reason and faith are both indispensable tools we can use to understand God's creation. Evolving Faith, Wanderings of a Mormon Biologist is a collection of essays about Mormon theology, evolution, the environment, and other issues. Stephen Peck has the mind of a scientist, the soul of a believer, and the heart of a wanderer. In Evolving Faith, he provides welcome companionship for women and men engaged in the unceasing quest for further light and knowledge. Evolving Faith is part of the Living Faith book series from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. To learn more about this series, go to maxwellinstitute.byu.edu slash livingfaith. Living Faith books are available at amazon.com. Today we're talking with Julia Watts Belzer. She joins us from Georgetown University, my old stomping grounds, and uh, she's the author of the book Power Ethics and Ecology in Jewish Late Antiquity. Uh, the subtitle is Rabbinic Responses to Drought and Disaster. Um, to kind of wrap things up, I, I, th I wanted to talk a little bit about theology. So your book is paying attention to rabbinic theology. It's looking more carefully at how these ancient Jewish texts think about God. You're getting into their heads. And, and you observe that 
in, in academic Jewish circles today, uh, as we talked about a little bit before, there are some anxieties about the relationship of theology and scholarship, and I wanted to kind of end by exploring that a little bit more. Sure, sure. So for many years, it was common to hear people say things like, Jews don't do theology. Right? And what I think people meant by that statement that that was that Jews don't do theology like medieval Christian theologians did. Right? Of course, now, today, there's a whole range of ways that Christian communities are doing theology as well. Right? But in any respect, we don't tend to see systematic treatments of theological ideas, like comprehensive claims about God or belief that aim to sum up the necessary, proper way that practitioners should believe. That just that type of thinking, that type of writing doesn't really appear in rabbinic texts. Even that phrase I just said a minute ago, practitioners, right? I think that speaks to an important way that scholars of Jewish studies tend to see Jewish religiosity. Right? It's a religious Judaism is a religious tradition focused more on practice not on articulating a single mode of right belief. Does, it, does that have anything to do with the nature of authority in, in the Jewish community at all? Because you, you kind of talk about they don't do theology, but it's in terms of like the way that, that religion plays out for Jewish believers. But is there also a component of authority there? Because I think in Mormonism, we, we would a lot of people say the same thing. We don't do theology, but we have authorities within the church who interpret texts and sort of provide an authoritative standpoint, right? So does authority so in come a, in? In a traditional framework, the authority is um, emerging in terms of rabbinic texts uh, and their interpretations in the medieval, late medieval, early modern, contemporary period that are focused on law, that is, questions of Jewish practice. Right? So you can have right or wrong practice. Of course, that's a loaded question today because there's a lot of different ways that Jews practice. Yes. I'm not taking a stand here one way or the other. Um, but again, from a traditional, uh, from a traditional framework, right, the idea is that you might have an orthopraxy Right? But there's a, a lot of openness, right? a, a surprising perhaps amount of openness from an outsider's perspective about matters of about how one might respond to or think about matters of belief. Right? We see that actually a lot in Bavli Tani, where it tells many stories about what in Jewish circles we call agada, legends, tales, narratives. You don't have to believe any of that stuff. I mean, you can, right? <laughs> but you don't have to. Right? If, but uh, practice then becomes, at least in traditional context, an important litmus test for assessing Jewish religiosity, not whether your beliefs line up. Okay, and, th and I think that plays into why some people would say then Jews don't do theology, because they're thinking exactly. of theology in terms of that sort of Christian systematic model, and, exactly. and granted, not there aren't really people doing that. Okay, so so <laughs> you'd say like disowning the idea of theology altogether then is, is a mistake. I do think it's a mistake. I think it's important to examine the way that Jews and Jewish texts are grappling with matters of of meaning, of, uh, of, of belief. Right? This is not to say that, that we have to believe like they did, right? Or in fact, that there's a uniformity of belief in these texts, because there's certainly not. Right? But there's, um, there's a lot more here. Right? There's a lot of juicy material to explore in terms of meaning, in terms of these, um, these uh, questions of, of, of significance. I also don't think there's such a sharp distinction between belief and practice. Theological ideas, ideas about meaning and its significance are embedded in and expressed through practice. Practice makes sense in part because it's embedded in a framework of larger significations, symbols, and meanings. So part of my work has been to understand and better uncover what some of, the, what, what some of that symbol network looks like in rabbinic texts about fasting and drought and rain. So now that we've got an idea that it's of what it's not. It's not the sort of systematic theology kind of on a Christian model. So what what would be Jewish theology as, sure. as you see it playing out? So here again, I want to I want to emphasize that I'm thinking particularly about the kind of emergent theological uh, ideas that I see being expressed in rabbinic texts. So I'm not making I don't want to make larger claims about what Jewish theology is or should be. Right? But I'm interested in thinking about the kind of uh, the kind of thinking, the kind of meaning thinking, the kind of meaning making that's happening in uh, in the Babylonian Talmud. So one of the things I try to do in my book is to show that Bavli Tani is articulating a complex and multivocal theology. First of all, it doesn't speak with a single voice. 
And it doesn't emphasize coming to a single overarching theological claim. It doesn't try to impose a particular set of beliefs upon its readers. Quite the contrary. Actually, what I think this text is doing is fracturing some of the more straightforward religious claims that we see in earlier biblical or rabbinic texts. It's contesting and challenging some of these ideas. It's opening up other possibilities. So in rabbinic texts, when we, when we think about rabbinic, rabbinic law and the way rabbinic law works in the Talmud, Scholars of Jewish law have often talked about the kind of dialog the dialogic or dialectical process of debate. Right? And actually, I see that kind of uh, point, counterpoint, response, alternative, suggestion, right? that kind of uh, dialectical approach, right? I argue, is also in some respects, in a different way, present in the agadic, in the, in the, um, in the stories as well, right? as these stories are thinking about questions of meaning, questions of merit virtue. Right? My book asks a lot of questions about ethics and the, the way in which rabbinic texts imagine the ethical, um, the ethical responsibility right? and also the grapple with the ethical shortcomings, their own ethical shortcomings. Right? So there's a lot of opportunities for, for it to think through these questions in a very open-ended and uh, and and uh, multivocal way. Yeah, they, they model a way that you can critically engage with not only the past of the rabbis or some of the mistakes of the rabbis, but also the complications of the authoritative texts, the revered texts, that you can actually grapple with those too, and, uh, and, and the different people do different things with those texts. Um, the, the flip side of that would be... It, does it risk becoming an interminable discussion, or is that the point? Like uh, The Talmud is an interminable discussion, yeah. and I think that is the point. Right? This is a text that, at the end of the day, is not... If you want a, if you want a sort of uh, concise and clear answer to a question of, of Jewish law or Jewish practice, the Talmud is the last place to look. Right? The best place to look is to go to the bookshelf and pull out a nice, concise code of Jewish law that's been systematized by one of the 16th or 17th, 17th, 17th century rabbis to sort of articulate the sort of uh, take-home message. The Talmud is, a, is, the texture of the Talmud is, it's, it's digressive, it's reflective, it can go down the, it, it, go, it loves to go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> So in, in many respects, this is a text that aims to invite its readers, its students, to a process of study. And the journey here, I mean, to use the, the old phrase, the journey here is actually perhaps not more important than the destination, but certainly just as important. Right? Of course, the Talmud cares about practice. Right? It's, it's composed in a, in a culture, in a religious milieu in which right practice and right action is very important. But ultimately, I think this is a text that aims to inculcate its readers into a love of study for its own sake, a love of text and tradition and learning that sees value in always going deeper, always turning over another possibility, another, another, another alternative. Now, I was going to ask, is that how you see it really playing out in the lives of contemporary Jewish believers, then? That's, that's how it plays itself out practically as... How they practice religion. Yes, yes, yes. So this is, I think, um, oh, this that idea that Talmud study is in fact a sort of, first of all, a religious act in its own right. Right. Again, it's not just uh, when I talk with my students about this, I say it's not just a matter of studying for the exam. This is not an exam you can cram for. Right? Hmm. It's a, it's an invitation to a life of study, a life of learning. Right? Uh, at the end of the day, the rabbis imagine this as Torah. They imagine all of this as the outflowing of the of divine revelation and the divine word. So you can never uh, you can you can never grasp all of it. You can never finish it. You can never conclude it. Right? But you can always go deeper. That's Julia Watts Belser, assistant professor of Jewish studies in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University. Today we were talking about her new book from Cambridge University Press. It's called Power, Ethics, and Ecology in Jewish Late Antiquity. Now that you've got this project completed, um, and you've been working on it a while, you said it goes even back to your dissertation, um, what's up next for you? So I'm working on a new book now that will uh, be coming out, God willing, with Oxford University Press. It is examining Babylonian rabbinic responses to the Roman destruction of the uh, Jerusalem temple 
so in this project, I read, I'll be, I, I'm reading rabbinic stories of destruction, this new project, through the prism of gender, sexuality, ecology, and disability studies. Uh, in some ways, I'm still sticking with the theme of disaster, right? Yeah. I'm uh, working on the one of the um, the the foundational catastrophe in rabbinic thought. But here, I'm interested in thinking about uh, parsing its implications socially, culturally, and theologically in terms of rabbinic memory. So I'm thinking about rabbinic memory, but also aiming to grapple with the materiality of destruction, the fact that destruction is not just an idea, it's not just a theological event, something that happened to people's bodies, to people's lives. This is a conquest story. This is a in many ways a, a, a story about what we would today call colonialism, imperialism. Okay? So I want to ask how that those material dimensions of destruction affect rabbinic understandings of body, sexuality, corporeality, ecology. This is a book that traces the impact that Roman colonial violence leaves on the flesh and on the land, as well as in the mind and the memory. So in addition to working on that project, I, uh, you're also teaching and doing other things. Yes, I, I teach at Georgetown. This semester I'm teaching one uh, version of our introductory course in theology in the theology department called Problem of God. But here at Georgetown I often teach courses on uh, Judaism in late antiquity, uh, the Talmud, Judaism and gender, and also a course on religion and disability studies. How far out do you think the book is? So I'm working on the final chapter now, and then of course there's a long process of uh, revision, review, conversation with other scholars. So, uh, but uh, but it's it's coming along. Good. It's, coming, it's been a wonderful project, fun project to work on. Very good. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. It was really fun talking about this book. Thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure.